all the banks, Amazon Bank, your car bank, your mortgage bank, your credit card, there's, these are all banking systems. And all these banking systems are designed psychologically, pragmatically, all the pieces to separate from us from our money. And they want our money in their pockets and not on our pockets. So they make it as easy as possible for us to spend our money. So if we're not attached to our own like desire to be wealthy and to learn and understand these financial principles and put them to work, it's still hard, it, you know, because it's such a force. It's still difficult, even when you're paying attention not to come be pulled into that force. But if you're not paying attention, you're not driven by the desire to become financially and free, financially free and wealthy they're going to take all your money. Like it's just such a big, strong, forced system that you can't win unless you've got a plan to, you know, to fight against it in a way. Hey, it's Rocky. Welcome to Richer Soul. Today's guest is Christina Wise, who will share how to create your wealthy life. Imagine it's 12 months from now and you've achieved your major life goals. How does it feel to be in the best shape of your life? To wake up energized, excited about the day, to have great relationships and friends who support you and propel you forward. How does it feel to have an excess of money, to be able to make the choices you want, to be fearless and open to trying new adventures? Imagine being connected to the universe and it providing everything you desire. It's possible over time, and your past does not dictate your future. The only thing holding you back from this vision is you. It's time to take control of our thoughts and use them to our advantage. Welcome to Richer Soul, where we achieve our dreams and bring balance to health, wealth, relationships, time, and spirituality. If you have not had a chance to listen to episodes one through nine, I encourage you to go back and listen to the framework behind Richer Soul and how to create the life of your dreams. You can also find all the show notes for this episode at richersoul.com. Today's quote comes from the Talmud. We will be held accountable for all the permitted pleasures we failed to enjoy. Don't forget to enjoy the ride of your life because that's where happiness is, on the ride. If you're waiting for something, well, chances are you might be dead before you enjoy it. Today, we've got a guest on to share another journey of building wealth and learning from mistakes made, both on the personal and the business side. But more importantly, what makes for a wealthy life and how do we go from where we are to where we want to be? We both have read and listened to many of the same people, so it's fun for me to have this conversation. Christina Wise has made it her life's work to master money. She's a self-made millionaire with training and study under some of the business's world's most sage and seasoned mentors. Her systems for wealth creation work in good times and in bad. And after nearly losing her life in 2013 and spending almost a half a million dollars to recover, her mission is to inspire others to build extraordinary wealth and optimal health. She's a best-selling author and an international speaker. She loves talking about money and helping people build their wealth and their optimal health. Let's meet Christina and learn how. Welcome to Richer Soul, Christina Wise. It's great to have you join us today. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. And I'm excited to learn from you and chat about money. We always like to start at the beginning, though. What was it like when you were growing up and how much did your school and family teach you about money? That's a funny question. I think my answer is probably the same as 99% of everybody else's answer, that Parents and money taught me nothing about money. Yeah, parents in school taught me nothing about money. And, you know, even my story, my money story is I actually started in a trailer home 
and grew up really a good portion of my my childhood without any. So, I mean, it was food stamps, it was powdered milk, it was uh, only getting meat, you know, once or twice a month based on some government type handouts. So that was that piece of just growing up in that type of environment. My my parents were very uneducated, so there was a lot of just education in general. And then there was a lot of arguing and alcoholism and other things like that, that what I remember as a kid is that my parents fought about money all the time. And it, I mean, it was shouting matches. It would be, you know, glass, broken, you know, glass thrown across the room and it, it breaking. And, and so what money was for me, and I think many others, is it was a very unsafe topic. So I grew up scared of money, like literally knowing that if this thing called money became part of a conversation, all hell was likely to break, break, break loose. So it became something I was afraid of and avoided for, I'd say, a good portion of my life. Remind me, did you go to school for an MBA? I, went, I did like a, an entrepreneurial MBA, but not an official MBA. Okay. Just out of curiosity, did they tell you, teach you how to make money and handle money there? Well, the funny thing is, Rocky, is that going into college, I, I mean, part of that story is that that's, I was afraid of money, but then I was very motivated to get out of my circumstances. So from a young kid, the only way to have money was to make it myself. So, I mean, I would do anything to make money. So I became very entrepreneurial at a young age and I started learning like, hey, if I make money, I can buy things. If I can buy things, I can get status. With that status, I can then get the right pair of jeans or the right, the right emblem on my shirt that will allow me to be more included. So I started to get trained that, that I would be excluded without money, but I could be included with money. So you kind of think how we get wired as children and then there was a certain acceptance there. So with all of that, I was very inclined to want to be rich at a younger age before I even really knew what that word meant. But rich was anything outside of my environment because it was so poor. But I actually went to college. My undergrad, I got two degrees. I got both a, a business finance degree and I got an accounting degree. And I was actually worked for a big six accounting firm after school. So I share all of that because I went to like undergrad business and got a separate accounting degree and was sitting for my CPA, all of these things in this desire to want to be rich and want to, you know, make money. And, you know, on the other side of that story is with those degrees, I didn't learn anything about money. So that's what's fascinating about the whole story is that I actually went to school to learn money and I came out with degrees that taught me nothing about money in real life. And that's why when you said two degrees, that's why I thought you had an undergrad and a grad degree in, in that. But you, you got two undergrads in, in that space. And, and I knew that it was kind of ironic because I, I, too, have degrees in finance and business and they don't teach you how to build wealth, nor do they teach you how to handle money, <laughs> nor do they talk about the emotional side of money. None of those things. It's all missing. Yeah. And it's interesting because when I got out of school and got into business is that I was doing very well in business, but I was basically bankrupt personally. And again, it just didn't make sense. Like, how can I be paycheck to paycheck and basically bankrupt and all these things? So I'm making this really high income and doing fairly well, relatively speaking, in business. Like it just, none of it quite made sense, but I just kept doing what I thought I was supposed to do, which was work harder and try to build a bigger business. So what changed? You know, for me, it was, there was this moment and like I was talking about, I was working really hard. I was in real estate at the time and I was making, I was a top producer, was making a really high income, especially, I mean, I'd make more in one year than my parents probably made in a lifetime. And I thought I won the lottery because here I was like making all this money. And then uh, I was in a marriage in a situation where we fought about money all the time. And no matter how much money I made, the fights got bigger. And it just, it was a shit show and I couldn't understand it. And then I was just like I said, well, maybe the answer to all my money problems is just to go make more because every month we don't have any and we're fighting over it. 
And I couldn't understand why that marriage ended. And when it ended, I had spent so much time like fighting the divorce and all these things that my basically my income deteriorated because it was a fully commissioned job. And I was focused on trying to keep all these possessions that we'd bought during that that time. And I wasn't paying attention. And I came out of that completely bankrupt where uh, lost the house, lost the cars, lost all of the money. And I was, I mean, I was beyond broke. We also, I was a primary wage earner. So we had credit card debt that I wasn't even aware of that we had that I had to take on. There were tax liens that weren't paid because I didn't even understand how taxes worked. Just all these things, like you said, are these very basic things we should know about money. We're, I thought you were working for an accounting firm. <laughs> exactly. Well, this was not your accounting firm, but yes. Uh, and but all the things. And I, I mean, I was I was broke, but it was beyond broke. It was like existential financial despair. I could not pay rent. I could not feed my children. I was scared. I didn't have any backup plan. I didn't have any savings. And I didn't know what to do. So I think many of us that have gone, you know, have left that journey and gone to this wealth building side, what I call the wealth building journey, is I was desperate. And I told myself, I said, man, the only way out of this is I've got to figure it out. Like I, and I mean, I was breaking down. I'm my kids, I'm crying and breaking down. My kids are scared. And I'm in this moment, Rocky, where I thought, oh my God. I worked so hard to escape my childhood and I'm recreating my childhood with my own children, like being broke and all the things. So I asked, I realized like there have been other people before me that have created wealth and that aren't in this situation. What do I do? So I actually, back then we went to libraries and went to the library and started looking at books of what, you know, something about money. And I came across the book called Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And I think that book has been such a beginning, so many of us, and it just broke my mind that again, after my question was, man, after all this education and business education and accounting education and finance education, I learned more in this book about money than I've learned over all these years of study. So that's where it changed is me being in a very desperate situation of not being able to put a roof over my head or feed my children to a place where this one book shifted the way I thought about money. And once I learned that a different way to think about it and the way to feel about it, it, you know, sent me on a different road that is very different than I'd say most of my peers were, you know, were staying on at that time. Why do you think so many people struggle with money? You know, I, I, it's funny, I get asked that question all the time and I'm sure you do too. And all I, I'd be curious what your answer is, but what I've what I've boiled it down to is that money's common sense in a way, meaning we make it and we spend it, and that it seems like it should be really obvious, and but it's not obvious. So much thing, so much about money and wealth is actually counterintuitive and countercultural. So when we have no education about what money is when we don't have any type of good role, role models since our parents didn't teach us. We really are as a culture, we're even though we can make high incomes, we're culturally financially ignorant and financially illiterate when it comes to how money, the principles of money and how money truly operates. So with this ignorance that we have, it creates a lot of financial situations that are stressful and and um, and chaotic and in many cases sad. So, I mean, ultimately, I think that there's, I mean, I know you believe that there's just a lot more money than meets the eye. And when we're ignorant, it, we create a lot of bad financial situations for ourselves. And again, it's just a lack of education because it's not hard to learn. It's not hard to understand. It's not hard to apply. But again, ignorance creates the dissatisfaction and the and the trauma. Well, and I agree with you. I think part of it is consumerism culture. Part of it is I want it now culture. Um, it has dramatically changed because if you go back, well, I guess about 70 years, right? Credit cards didn't exist. Uh, you, 
you pretty much I think there was more of a a feeling with money in the sense that you used actual bills. And I, I know that I think young people have not come to realize this, but when you pay for something with a hundred dollar bill, it just feels different than when you're paying for it with a 10 or a 20. Now, I guess in today's world with inflation, a hundred dollar bill isn't what it used to be, but it's just that whole concept of, of, turning something over versus just swiping and tapping where there's it's kind of removed all the emotion from it or at least the even the consideration because i know with my credit card you know at the end of the month i'm like oops i guess we spent a lot last month i didn't notice that but when it comes to cash i i've noticed throughout life that i'm more cognizant of how much comes and goes yeah for sure we're no longer in a cash culture I mean, there's a couple things at play here. There's one is really just not understanding basic financial principles. And the most basic financial principle that we all get and we all understand is the principle of spending less than you make. And it's that simple that the secret to building wealth is if we boil it down is to spend less than you make and invest that difference basically one way or another. Yet, Whether we're doing a cash method or whether we're doing a swipe method, people still, I call it the break even, meaning they spend every dollar they make and then some debt allows us to spend even more money than we make. That's the danger that's today as opposed to, you know, 20 years ago, maybe. But again, there is no wealth. There is no surplus. There is no financial security and safety when we don't have a surplus of money. And that is what wealth is. It's, it's extra cash, it's assets, it's, it's these things. So fundamentally, we cannot spend everything we make, but from the beginning of time, people spend everything they make, which betrays one of those financial principles, that one of the financial principles says you have to create a surplus. So that's part one. Now, when that's exacerbated today, I remember probably when you and I were both in college, uh, I, to put myself through college, you know, I had to get scholarships and I got, I got loans, but back then there were small loans. You didn't bankrupt yourself by going to college and getting loans. And I got some grants and some different things just based on income class, income. But I, the point of that is I had a very limit, I had a very fixed amount of money I could spend every month. And so to, and it was cash only. So I'd have money in my bank account. And then I think you remember the days I had a cash register. And every time I wrote a check, I'd go to the back of those check, that checkbook and I'd write down in the register how much I spend. And I start with my beginning balance and you subtracted you, it, with the ending balance. And in college, it pretty much went down the dollar. But I couldn't spend $10 over what was in that account because there was no debt. There was no credit cards, for example. So based back then, it was even though we might have spent every dollar we made betraying the wealth principle is you have to create a surplus, it was hard to overspend because there was no money you had access to. The danger, And you're kind of forced to semi keep these check registers. Now, today, the problem is, is like you said, that it's so easy to overspend and it's so easy to not keep track of our money because not only is it I mean, we don't think that credit card companies know that we are so much more detached from our money when it's a card versus when it's cash. That's why they make it very easy. But with the the credit card companies, all the companies, what's happened is we have Venmo Pay, Apple Pay, Google Pay, credit card pay. And it's so impossible to keep track of all these payments and therefore so easy to overspend. And we can go into debt on top of it. That consumerism has kind of always been there, but today it's so much easier to uh, to live a life that we can't afford. And when we do that, we're going to get ourselves into financial trouble one way or another. It, at the very least, we're never going to build wealth and create financial freedom. Not to mention I can get Amazon on my phone and shop away without even thinking twice. Well, they make it very easy to understand, like, it is a big rig system out there. Like, when you start studying this, you'll see the rig. Like, you think Amazon, I mean, Amazon, I get upset when my package doesn't get here in two days now. Like, we're so conditioned for immediate gratification. 
that we get upset. I remember you used to have to wait a month for something to get mailed to you, for example. But all the all the banks, Amazon Bank, your car bank, your mortgage bank, your credit card, there's these are all banking systems. And all these banking systems are designed psychologically, pragmatically, all the pieces to separate from us from our money. And they want our money in their pockets and not on our pockets. So they make it as easy as possible for us to spend our money. So if we're not uh, in, con- like if we're not attached to our own like desire to be wealthy and to learn and understand these financial principles and put them to work, it's still hard, it, you know, because it's such a force. It's still difficult, even when you're paying attention not to kind of be pulled into that force. But if you're not paying attention, you're not driven by the desire to become financially and free, financially free and wealthy, they're going to take all your money. Like it's just such a big, strong, forced system that you can't win unless you've got a plan to, you know, to fight against it in a way. And that's what people need to do. They need to figure out a plan and go execute it. And it's a lot simpler than I think people make it. Now, on top of all the financial struggles, you also had a health struggle, correct? I did. It's an interesting story, Rocky, is that at first, my first lesson, money lesson was that you can't, like, how much money you make is not um, equal to how wealthy you are. And I was in this belief structure that I could just go sell the next house and I could pay my bills next month. And, you know, it just got until that didn't work anymore. So I learned out of that first lesson is that wealth is different than income and I need to create wealth and, you know, learning through from Robert Kiyosaki to begin with. And then all my learning after that, I learned that, oh, I need to have, I need to have a wealth strategy. I have to build a portfolio. I have to build net worth. I need to save my money and invest it. And I have to do that diligently and I have to reverse engineer into some numbers. So I did all that. And so then I really worked to be a good business owner and and build a really good, successful, profitable business. And I learned to build a net worth. So I started investing in real estate and was doing well there. And I was doing both of those things separately, you know, for my own personal, you know, income and net worth. But what I was still so attached to the money that no matter how much money I made or had, it was never enough. So I just work harder and I just do more. And I believed in this mantra, more is better. And I basically just almost killed myself accidentally by working too hard and burning the candle at both ends and not paying attention to my health and using and abusing my body. Because I was so attached to this narrative of, I need more, I need more, I need more. And what happened is that my body basically just gave out. And so I got very sick and I ended up fighting for my life for for close to two years. Now, what's interesting about that story is that I learned so many money lessons, even though I'd learned those first lessons and was, you know, had money. What was interesting is when I was so sick, I didn't care about all my money and those possessions. All I wanted was my health back. And I was on like this proverbial deathbed, just full of shame, regret, remorse, that all my energy had been focused on money and success, money and success, money and success, just thinking I'd just live my life and do, I don't know, other things later on. And that was just so anybody that's been sick can relate that it's this place like, all the money in the world doesn't matter. You just want your health back. So that really shifted where I am today is that, oh, when what also happened is that I had my, I had some passive income from real estate cash flow, and I had some assets that I could sell. So I basically had to completely liquidate everything I owned to pay for all this health care and everything that wasn't covered by insurance. So what was happening then money-wise when I was so sick, I couldn't work. And so what happened to my business is started deteriorating really fast. So that income was gone. I was living, I always had some cash flow from the assets that helped out a little bit, but then I had to start liquidating. So that was going away. So all of this money and wealth that I'd spent, you know, a decade working so hard to, to create and to build, it all vanished within like two years, all because I didn't pay attention to my health. 
And so that taught me this big lesson is like, yes, all that's important, but the game isn't about financial success for the sake of having more money. The money is for the sake of, the money is just there so that we can live a healthy life, that we can have, we can invest in our bodies, we can invest in our families, we can invest in our experiences, and we can invest in our old age. But I had it backwards. I just thought if I figured out the money and just worried about the money, somehow life would figure itself out. And I learned like, no, it's life first, and then just know how much money is enough to underwrite the cost of living well. So that was my big lesson then that's brought me to teach what I teach today. It's like, yes, money is important. But it's not the be all end all. It's just knowing how much money is enough, knowing your numbers, and then reverse engineering everything into, hey, as long as I have this amount of income and I have a much, this amount of much, this much future income that comes from my assets when I, you know, when I retire, that's what my focus is on financially. And outside of that, it's to live life well and to enjoy life and create experiences and and have and know that our money is meant to be spent on things that actually bring meaning and fulfillment to our lives, not possessions and status and and so many of the things that we spend our time trying to to accumulate. I find most people can't answer that question of how much is enough. It seems like the goalpost moves constantly. Every time you get close, they move it out and they're constantly chasing, never enjoying. And that's kind of a shame. It really is the trap. And I was in that trap. Uh, so many others that I work with is the trap, but we're kind of conditioned that way. You know, and then there's Parkinson's law of money that says that expenses will always rise to match income. And so we're always in the chase. Like, okay, we hit a certain level of income and that's not enough. So we hit that we go up to the next level of income. That's not enough. But, but our expenses, that expense creeps happen. So we're always chasing the next level of income. And it's tiring. And then sometimes you get sick and you're missing your life. But it's always the chase of money. It's not the, it's not the creation of a good life. And then knowing and all how much money is enough, it's, it's a really, I think, asking ourselves the question of how much is enough is one of the most important philosophical and practical questions we can ever ask ourselves. And it's really important to find the answer to that. And it's about satisfaction. Like we need to find a place where we are satisfied, where we are fulfilled, when there is enough, when, when we can enjoy things. And when there is enough, it doesn't mean we have to stop. It just means that that's enough money. If I never had more money than this, I would be totally fine. And life is really good. And I don't have to constantly chase more because when we're chasing more money, it's not the money we're chasing, but it's some hole inside of us usually that we're chasing. So we're trying to fill that hole by being accepted that if we're in the next social class, maybe then I'll feel better about myself or maybe then I'll be happier or then I'm included or I get that type of house or that type of watch or that type of travel. So again, it, it, but that means we're always dissatisfied because in that dissatisfaction then philosophically and spiritually means we're living a life that's not joyful. Thinking that joy comes later is like, no, the joy needs to be here today. And however much we have today is enough for today and being okay. And then, you know, working towards the amount that's like, all right, this is plenty of money for me to live life the way I want to live it. That gives me enough time and space to do the things I want to do and spend time with the people I want to spend time with. And that's the key, having the time freedom and the ability to enjoy in the moment, not constantly. I know for me, it was, I'll be happy when in, in that. But then there's also the personal growth side. And I think this came from your website. There was a statement, if you're not slightly embarrassed by who you were last year, you're not going fast enough. And that almost seems like, though, a dichotomy to what we're talking about. Like, or is it just more that you continually grow as a person? It, it doesn't necessarily have to be about more money or. Well, one of my favorite quotes from one of my mentors said, you're either becoming or becoming old. You know, so part of the personal spiritual growth side is to always be learning, always be curious, not get fixed in our beliefs and our mindsets and 
and get stuck. It's to be curious, to ask lots of questions. What's next? Why do I believe this way? How do you believe? Why do we believe the way you believe? And to, and, and to be expanding ourselves and growing. Because to me, that's where fulfillment comes from, is knowing who we are, loving ourselves, becoming ourselves, understanding our purpose, why we're here, how we contribute, how we love, how we feel loved, how we belong, how we create a sense of belonging for others. This is the human fulfillment and the human actualization. So that's what I mean by that quote that, that you know, we, I want to look back that it's like, wow, I don't even really recognize who I was last year because I've just grown so much. And that's always the case. Now, that has nothing to do with money. Now, money I, is important also. Like just being in a spiritual place without worrying about the finances means, you know, you're not going to be able to actualize a lot of your dreams because money matters. But the money piece, when we can make it versus making money about the chase and making our our satisfaction in our, again, love of self, feeling a sense of good enough, again, connect to that purpose. That's where we feel resolute. That's where we feel actualized. That's where we feel worthy. Now, part of that, there's the money piece to that. So as entrepreneurs, many times we can make money through our purpose of our work, for example. But we don't want the, we don't want the chase to be about money. Money becomes the byproduct of who we are and the offers that we make and the value that we're able to contribute to the world. So when the focus is on who I am and what value I can produce and create in the world and how I can contribute and the market value of that and how well I can create a business to help more lives and transform more people, the byproduct then can be more money. But again, the money is not the focus. The money is a byproduct of of the focus. Um, so it's both of this, it's this both and of we don't want to be focused as the money is the be all end all, but you still have to have a focus on money and you have to be able to hold both of those kind of polarities in a way at the same time. Today's episode is sponsored by Profit Answer Man Podcast. Did you know that most small business owners hate looking at their financials? It's one reason they may struggle with business success. The Profit Answer Man podcast helps them ensure they are profitable and can pay their employees and weather the storms we all have to face. It's built on the Profit First methodology of pay yourself first. The Profit Answer Man podcast is a must listen to for every small business owner and anyone who wants to help them survive and thrive. Check it out on your favorite listening platform. That you do. Actually, one of my favorite writers in the business space is somebody that we both enjoy, Keith Cunningham. And a big part of what he talks about in his book, I mean, I think there's like 700 plus questions in there. It's all about thinking time you know, and how to think about what we're doing. Because I think just like money, people don't take the time to stop and think about their business, their goals, their what they want. They don't get clarity at all. And then you're running in circles or you're taking massive risks. I mean, that whole book of his the Road Less Stupid came out of the crash, I think, of 07, 08, where he lost everything because he didn't think enough about the different parts of it. I know you've been through some of his programs. I'd love to hear your wisdom on it. Yeah, I mean, Keith, you know, I think one of the life principles maybe is that, you know, I guess another, I don't know who said this quote, but standing on the shoulder of giants and and that that. That quote always really resonated with me that, that, you know, it's important to have mentors and leaders and those that we can follow and learn from. And there are just so many great mentors and leaders in the world that we can study and learn from. And Keith Cannon Cunningham was one of my mentors. So he's been one of my, I'd say, business mentors. And I've learned so much from him. And it's funny, I was just telling somebody else the other day that so many of my mentors are now retiring and Keith is one of those. So, you know, we're probably looking at, you know, our mentors are probably somewhere between 
a minimum of 10 to probably 20 years older than we are because they've got that 10 to 20 years more of life experience, life and business experience. So I'm thinking, man, my mentors are retiring. But anyway, Keith is just such a mastermind. But what Keith teaches, I think, more on the business side of the equation, not the kind of the wealth and the personal life side of the equation. But it's just that is that he calls it thinking time and that we the best, you know, we need to look at our life through a series of questions, basically, and spend time thinking about that. On the life side and under that same context, there's a great book that's called um, by Napoleon Hill and is called Outwitting the Devil. And it's talking about the same thing philosophically that he's saying, you need to be able to think for yourself. You need to be able to sit down and know and ask yourself, "What what are my beliefs? What are my values? What is my good life? How do I think for myself? How do I make sure I protect myself from groupthink and and these big system, you know, systematic, you know, forces of thinking, like the banking culture, for example, the money culture. And but the same thing. But I think bottom line, what you're getting at is that so few people t- take the time to ask themselves, "What is a good life? What is my good life?" and and write it out, create it, like write it down. Spend time thinking about it. We get one life that we know of here. Like, let's make it good. But we have to design it. My good life is different than your good life than is different than somebody else's. So it starts with asking ourselves, what is a good life? And what are, what are my dreams? What are my passions? What is my purpose? And getting clarity on that. Because that's our place of fulfillment. And then we follow it up by how much does it cost to live it? And that becomes the financial goal part is like, how much does it cost to live my good life? And I mean, what is my good life and how much does it cost to live it? And then being passionate about that and putting our stake in the ground, like this is my stand and this is my good life. And I'm not, I mean, do my best not to screw it up, even though we're going to do our own screw ups and And, but I'm going to think for myself and I'm going to kind of follow my own rules, you know, with integrity and ethics and that type of thing. And with, but, you know, with these different stakes in the ground, these different targets and this clarity, now we can be much more likely to stay on track and create our dreams and manifest our, you know, everything that we want in our life. But like Napoleon Hill says that if we don't have that clarity, we're going to drift. And he talks about drifting. And drifting means you just kind of drift at whatever life is pulling at you. You're just reacting to whatever is, is, you know, present in the moment, which means we don't have any control over our life. So at the end of the day, Keith and let's see Napoleon Hill, like the mentors and leaders, if they're, you know, real mentors like Keith Cunningham, that's been a mentor and a teacher to you and me and Napoleon Hill, which is more, you know, Someone, obviously, we've never met, but we would probably love to meet him if we got a chance to go back in time. All these greats are saying the same thing. Like, none of this is rocket science. But if we're not studying and learning from the greats, we're just going to go off on this path of winding up wherever we wind up, which in most cases isn't where we want to be. Well, if you don't define the target, right, then you will drift you will get distracted by shiny objects. You will get confused. You'll get pulled away. But when you have clarity on what is it that I want, where am I going? Am I focused on that? You can turn all the noise off. It's just like, no, that's not where I'm going. That's not what I want. That's very nice. Thank you. But no. And it's also, it's kind of weird because when when you define what you want and you tell your brain what you want, it activates and goes looking for what you're searching for. It's just like, oh, I want to go buy a new uh, whatever car. I see that car everywhere. It's that same principle. When I tell my brain, this is what I want from life. These are the things that I'm looking for. It shows you those opportunities wherever they come up. Your brain will will help you kind of find that and do that. Which kind of begs the next question, which also comes off of your website, I believe. Everyone thinks they need more knowledge. And knowledge isn't power. Taking action is power. I always tell people, I think we just chatted about this on the last episode. A ship in port doesn't need to be steered. Even if you steer it, it's nothing's going to happen, right? Until you get underway and you take 
action and start moving towards something, that's when when things start to happen. And I noticed in my life, especially, that was my biggest thing. I would take so long sometimes to take action. But the moment I took action, then things just skyrocketed. And I'm sure you believe similar. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I mean, you can be in the locker room planning out every every move of the game, but until you get on the field, there's no winning or losing. So so everything is on the field. And if it's, you know, there was the playoffs that was what Sunday night, and you know, you saw both teams on the field and they gave it their best. They spent a lot of time planning, they spent a lot of time watching videos, they spent a lot of time in the practice, but you have to play the game. And, you know, it's not a guaranteed win, obviously, but that's, that's where we learn. We learn on the field. We learn in that we learn getting our ass kicked. We learn by making mistakes. We learn by the success, what works and what doesn't work, but that all happens by only by action. And you have to be willing to get beat up a little bit. You know, they're, they're on the field and they get knocked down and they get back up. And, and that's just, it's just such a good metaphor for life, in my opinion. But yeah. Everything is action. I see too many people you know, there's two two problems there, I guess. One is like we talked about, it's not setting the goal in the first place. So I know for me, that first when I was, you know, in that place where I was completely broke and couldn't feed my children, that I, coming out of that experience, my first goal was I was going to be a millionaire. And, but that was just the goal. But it, before I didn't have a goal, my goal was just to work hard and make a lot of money and all my life was going to work out. And then, but I had sales goals. Like I was very goal for, focused with sales, but, and I hit those because I believed that I couldn't, if I didn't have sales goals, I wasn't going to make enough money. But the point is that once I be determined to, I was going to be a millionaire, a net worth millionaire, that was just the goal. Now is to take action. So then part of the action was to read books and to study real estate, to study investing. But then it couldn't just be about the study that I actually had to go risk some money and buy that first property. And, and so, but it, it's, it's each of these different pieces. You just can't study. You actually have to take the action. But all uh, where we are today is a result of all of our choices and the actions we've taken before today. So we can look back at the domino of, of the choices we've made and the actions we have or haven't taken to determine is, is this working or not? And yeah, so everything is, all right, I'm going to do my best to set the goals and targets and to create a plan. And now I have to get out on the field. You get out and you execute. And you, ex and you play the game and sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. But if you keep showing back up, and continuing to play, you don't lose until you quit. And as long as you don't quit, then you get to keep playing the game. And but sometimes it's like better than others. The, the point there is you have to love the game. Like if you're, well, that, looking, if you're just looking for the win on the other side of the, you know, when, when the game is over and then you lose, it's, it's, there could be a lot of dissatisfaction there. So you, you have to, you have to love the play of the game. Like when I, I just keep using the football analogy because, you know, it's just top of mind. But the, I just, I marvel at these athletes because they love playing the game. Like they are out there to win, but there's no guaranteed win. And they, I mean, they're, they just practice and they strive and they're, they're top 1% athletes and you see what they do. And, and I just, I love watching them, but I love watching like, hey, yeah, they love winning, but you can see they love playing, being out there on the field. And you can see them adjusting, you know, as the game goes on. So I think that's a big piece is, yeah, we want the end goals and results and targets to happen. But it's the love of the play. And to know the love of the play automatically comes with getting tackled, automatically comes with, you know, with losing sometimes, automatically comes with getting your ass kicked. And, uh, and if you think that you're going to be able to play without getting bruised or you're afraid of getting bruised, there, you know, you're not going to take action. So I, I think that's just a part that gets left out is, yeah, sometimes I get beat up. Sometimes it hurts. And 
you know, that's the cost of, of playing and playing big. You also get to define your game. So just understanding you can define the game you want to play on your terms. But again, it comes back to what we talked about, which is thinking time to define what you want and write it down and, and have it. So kind of shifting a little bit of gears to the business side, I know you're a fan of Profit First. Have, has that helped you in your business? Yeah, you know, it's so interesting that I had interviewed Mike on my podcast before I'd read the book. Uh, and so I learned before before Profit First is a book, kind of my own hard work, like just through trial and error of business, I realized like, why is it that I keep working harder and harder and I keep investing more and more in the business, yet I, I keep paying myself less and less? And it just seemed like, and I realized like this metaphor made me think of, oh my gosh, remember the cookie monster on Sesame Street? Like you get the cookies and he's like, cha, 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 cha. I'm like, that's what my business is. My business is a, is a cash eating monster. And I keep thinking kind of the same mentality. If I build it bigger, then that will, you know, finally one day I'll be able to pay myself enough. So finally coming out of that experience it, in my business came second because I was following a profit first like mentality personally. And personally, I even called it profit first because um, I understood profit. But profit first personally, whenever I paid myself, and this is, again, studying wealth principles, the surplus, I would take 20% of what I made every time I paid myself, and I would take move it out of my primary account, and I'd put it in my wealth account. So 20% off the top of every time I paid myself. And that's the money I used to ultimately buy real estate. So I would say pay myself first. So that was the mentality. I'd pay myself first, my future self first, and save that money. And then I'd live off the 80% of what's left over after taxes. So it was interesting that in personally, I was keep creating the surplus, surplus, surplus. It was working in my business. I just couldn't grow it because I just kept, the, the business kept just eating the money. So then it came to my own conclusion, like, I need to pay myself first in the business. Like, what's the minimum amount and do the same thing that the business can only spend what's left over. And so I started applying that in my business and it started working. So coincidentally, you know, years later came across, you know, Profit First and I was just reading this like, oh my God, yes, yes, yes. And I'd created a bucketing system and personal finance and I kind of done some bucketing in the business. And so all of that, I'm like, oh my God, like, thank God somebody finally put this in writing because Profit First is the way to run a profitable business. And so anyway, Profit first as a methodology for your business, I'm a firm believer in. I follow it myself, not to the T the way Mike Mike presents it, but you know, my own version of that. But it's to realize too that, like I said, it's not just profit first in our business, but we want to create profit first in our business. And then the money we pay ourselves out of that profit, let's just say it's hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year we pay ourselves. We move that $150,000 over to our household. Now it needs to be the same profit first mentality as pay myself the 20% profit off the top, take it out, put it in a separate account, and then let my lifestyle, you know, eat what's left over. So I believe in a profit first system across the board. And so many of the profit first uh, people I've worked with, they follow profit first in their business, but they've not applied it in household. And once they start applying that same concept, in their personal finance, that's where money really starts building as far as, you know, business finance and personal finance. It's funny because I did it in my personal finances. And then when I read the book, I was like, oh, this is just the way I do personal finances. It's adapted for business. Yeah, that makes total sense. I didn't realize that business owners weren't looking at their financials. And then I came to realize, oh, they're doing what they love. And just like people, because they are people, Finances is one of those topics they don't want to talk about, which created an, an issue. You actually have some programs to help people with money, don't you? I mean, I do. I I have two programs and and you know, I just I love talking Rocky, when you and I first met, it's like, I don't know, we we've learned the same lessons. We've it's I mean, I think we can just uh 
finish each other's sentences. So I, I really have loved my conversations with you because I think we've been on a similar journey. You probably just learned the lessons much faster than I did and didn't create as many big breakdowns for yourself as I did. Uh, I, you know, I have to, I have to learn lessons the hard way, but, um, the type of eye work that I do really matches with the type that work that you do. Now, what I do, I have two, um, I have a, what I call the money school. And in the money school, I have two programs. And one program is teaching entrepreneurs personal finance. Like I said, there's a difference between income and wealth, and there's a difference between business finance and personal finance. But if we want to be wealthy and financially free, we have to understand money, learn it, and get really good with it. So I teach people how to do that. And in my personal finance class, we, we ask the question, how much money is enough? And then I teach the personal principles and kind of the financial intelligence. And um, we create the targets and numbers to complete the, the plan for how we're going to hit our financial freedom target and how to manage money brilliantly in a way that keeps us on track. And then I have a personal, a business finance class where I teach business fundamentals and teach like what we're saying, like, hey, that's great. You're living your purpose. But if you don't follow the money and you don't understand how to read your financial statement, you don't know the difference between a profit and loss and a balance sheet, and you don't know these key metrics, you're just never going to make enough money in your business or you're going to be making far less money than you can because you have to, money is business or business is money. So um, we have to understand that. So I teach how to set up your business, set up your business financials, how to read your financials to make decisions. A lot of what Keith Cunningham teaches because he was my mentor. Then I love what you do is then you really help businesses track their money on a monthly basis and to, to you know, help them stay on track by offering that as a surface, as, as a service. So I teach people, I teach business centers and entrepreneurs how to understand money how to ask questions about money, how to manage their money so that when they work with those like you, they already have that base understanding that allows them to be very good partners with you. Well, and you, you're doing valuable work. And, and I think people do need to take the time to find the right resources to learn about money instead of too much of what's out there, which unfortunately there isn't either it's there's great information out there, but there's also a lot of bad information mixed in. And it becomes very hard to discern between the two until, well, you, maybe you have to make the mistakes. I don't know. Hopefully not. You've touched on the spirituality topic throughout, and I kind of want to wrap up there. How does spirituality fit into all of this? Wow, that's that's a big question. Again, to me, the spirituality piece is, for me personally, what's interesting, I'll say this, is that spirituality, spirituality was missing for me before I got sick because it was all business and money and success and achievement and accolades and awards and, and more is always better. And I mean, I was just really on that path. And I was detached. I was so detached from my own emotions and and any type of spiritual context. So it's not that I wasn't unhappy, but I wasn't happy. I wasn't unfulfilled, but I wasn't fulfilled. It was like, I'll be happy when type of thing, like what you said. When I got sick, that became what I called the spiritual journey, that so much of the importance of life and the meaning of life surfaced, mostly because I realized I'd wasted so much of my life in the chase that I was so regretful that I had made money my primary motivator. So coming out of that, I had to learn about myself. What I uncovered under all of that work is that kind of the reason why, especially the way I grew up, is I never felt worthy. I never felt good enough. I I felt, you know, I think I always felt dumb because I grew up with a, a pretty poor education and I felt inferior because of where I started from. And and I didn't feel loved because my parents were really absent and neglectful. So, you know, part of so much of that chase was me trying to find fulfillment through ch achievement and through this external validation. If other people think I'm great, maybe I really am great. But I didn't feel that about myself. And there was that big void there. And so, again, I was just trying to fill it with success. You know, 
some people fill that void with drugs and alcohol and and other things. I felt I filled that void through business and success. It, I mean, it was it was a it was like my drug. It, and so, the spirituality part is not being attached to any of that. It's like it's really that that work that I've done is connecting to universe and connecting to something far bigger than I am. That's just so peaceful and serene, and this love of self and a connection of knowing why I'm here and that I have a meaning and purpose and that I contribute. And, and that, you know, when I talk about this, I feel it in my stomach, just this so much joy and love and just realizing like, oh, I can love myself and I can love others and I am lovable and I am good and I am good enough. So that's part of that spiritual thing that no matter where I am, I take me with me. And that's that sense of contentment. And no matter where I am, I can connect to to universe regardless of how much money is on the bank account or how much this, that, and the other. And just uh, for me, it's just realizing that that's that's my um, that's where I stay rooted, and that's what keeps me connected to a sense of satisfaction and not out there trying to play the game of what everybody else thinks. And all of these things are connected. And again, it's up to you to define how do they work for you? What is enough? What do you want from your life? Which direction do you want to go? What kind of game do you want to play? All of these things come together and you get to determine what they are. And then you have to go take action and work towards it. And I, I think for a lot of people, it seems overwhelming. It's actually not that hard. It's pretty simple. But you've got to do what Keith always talks about. You've got to have thinking time and you just got to think about it all and say, this is what I truly want to do. This is the way I'm going to do it. And it's shocking how often it's possible. It is. You know, I'll share just a quick story and that, you know, just I call it the old me and the new me. And the old me was, again, more is better. And there was never an end to say when I got more clarity on what a, what a meaningful life is to me and what a good life is. And then I set my goals and targets every year. And, you know, in 2023, November of 2023, I set my personal goals for this year, 2024. And, you know, just like getting really clear again, it's not hard, like you said, but all right, what's going to make 2024 a great year? And one of those, and, and again, how much money is enough? So part of how much money is enough is I want to be able to fly out my kids and eventual grandkids to be able to spoil them and treat them and have my family in one place and to be able to laugh together, play games together and just enjoy life and be able to afford to do that. So that's part of my good life number, like how much money is that? And so just last weekend, you know, last week, you know, part of, and I wanted to, I had a goal for 2024 to do that. So uh, just last week, both of my children, my young adult children, and, you know, I paid for them to come out to Park City, Utah, and for their significant others to come out and spent, you know, spent all the money on the week of skiing and all the things that we did. And we played games in front of the fire and just all the things like, so I had this dream of what makes mom happy. And I was on cloud nine and it's just, it's so fun when you set these dreams and intentions that this is what's so meaningful is to have the time and financial resources to do it. And then we do it and just seeing so much happiness that we all had by spending this week together. And there is no worry. There's no anything. And just being in that moment, fully present, I put the business on hold for the week, you know, and it goes back to business as usual, but it's just, it's just a simple example of how it all works. And that's where the meaning is, is the happiness created by having these types of experiences and having the financial resources that allows us to create these types of memories and experiences, which is what we want to use our money for. We went the opposite way. We all went down to the Caribbean and enjoyed the warmth while the rest of the United States was frozen cold. (laughs) Kids came down, we had a blast and yeah, I stroked the check. I don't care. Like that's just part of what we do. And we're cool with that. And it all worked out wonderfully well. It's 
time to learn the secrets of life. What's your secret to living an abundant life? Oh, I mean, we've just talked about it. My secret to living an abundant life is just get very clear of what a good life is and what abundance is, and then take action to be able to create those resources to do that. And then I think the final piece is just to get to this place of knowing how to be satisfied with with life in the moment and be able to be fully present and to be able to truly enjoy the abundance in whatever form it, it is in the moment. And I, I have to say the power of clarity is just amazing. When you have clarity, everything else becomes easy. What did you learn later in life that you wish you would have learned sooner? <laughs> Yeah, again, everything we've talked about, I I wish I would have, if I could have told my younger self, it would be really, it doesn't matter what other people think. Get clarity on your life, what you want, and work on yourself and just work to to create meaning and fulfillment. But yeah, I spent way too much time worrying about what other people thought early on. Who cares what other people think? And... Learning begins when you leave school. (laughs) That's true. That's a good point. If you were to give an 18-year-old one specific piece of wisdom, what would it be? You know, we're we're talking about money. I think the piece of wisdom is to learn money, to to really learn money, the importance of money, how much money is enough, and to learn how to create wealth and financial abundance. Because when we really understand money, not the pursuit of money, meaning not the chase of the money, but just understand money the way you and I are talking about it and we've learned and studied, it just makes life easier. It does. It's funny because Keith starts out his book asking a question. If you could undo three money mistakes you made, basically, how much more money would you have today? And you know, when you start to think about it, especially at our age, we realize that it's millions of dollars that we screwed up on. Millions. And so millions. Make the right choices. Millions and millions. I mean, I don't even want to think about it. Uh, if people would like to learn more about you and your programs, what's the best way for them to do that? I I like to, what we didn't talk about here today is is personality. And so I have this money personality quiz that it's really fun to take that uh, because it's important to know like what our inclination is with money. Are we a saver? Are we a spender? Are we a risk taker? Are we the opposite? Are, you know, um, how are we, are we married to the opposite of what we are? So it's a really, it's a really fun, just little quiz to learn about ourselves when it comes to money. And uh, so that's it. Uh, wisemoneymethod.com slash quiz, wisemoneymethod.com slash quiz. And then uh, again, just fun money personality quiz. What's attached to that, if you take the quiz uh, as a gift for taking that quiz, even though the quiz is just super fun, there is a workbook that's called My Millionaire Formula, How Much Money is Enough. So it's a really nice guide and workbook that can help give you clarity on how much money is enough, everything that you and I just talked about. So that's a free gift that comes from taking that quiz. And then after that, uh, I have have my own podcast, which is called Wealthy Wealthy. Uh, It's wealthy like money, then wealthy, W-E-L-L-T-H-Y, the Wealthy Wealthy podcast. And uh, that's a good place just to continue these listening to these types of conversations. And we will link to all of those in the show notes. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Rocky. I really enjoyed it. If you have not read Outwitting the Devil by Napoleon Hill, I highly recommend it. If you're not following me on LinkedIn, you should. I do weekly short videos with a question from The Road Less Stupid by Keith Cunningham. If you don't have a life plan, then I would work on that. My favorite resource is Michael Hyatt's book, Living Forward. As we've said, define what you want, start taking action, because life is too short not to do it. By the way, who do you know who would appreciate this message? Would you do me a favor and share this episode with them? I'd appreciate that. Thank you. Next week, we've got Jonathan Beskin on. He's going to talk about how to succeed 
when everyone expects you to fail. Thanks for listening. Have an abundant week.